Hi, everybody, and good evening. Welcome to our third attempt at the broadcast, uh, reviewing Chapter 10, How to Get the Support That You Need. Today is June 7th, 2021. Like I've mentioned, I think we've repaired our issues. We have a backup system. If we have to, to pause for a moment, you won't even hear this. You won't even hear it on the podcast, but I'll just roll forward with it so we have a backup system in place. So like I was talking about with the last two times I introduced this topic, um, I was sharing with you the, this quote that I've since now looked up and included in my slide presentation attributed to John Lennon, where he said, being honest may not get you a lot of friends, but it'll always get you the right ones. That quote, being honest may not get you the, a lot of friends, but, it'll, but it will always get you the right ones, is probably the best, most practical, most straightforward example of what we mean when we talk about letting go of the outcome. If you show up as you are, and then that's a big stretch for any of us, but if we show up as we are and tell the truth about ourselves and, and our needs, then over time, the people that are around us will be people that are, can respond to that. And that's gonna be a theme throughout the broadcast this evening as parents. When I talk about getting the help you need and deserve, it means that you're going to have to say some scary and difficult things. It means that you're going to have to take some some gentle but but clear and firm positions with people that you love and that love you. And their ability to adapt or respond adequately will tell you about how much of a boundary you really need with this person. When we when we try to set a boundary with somebody in our lives and they respond by trying to talk us out of it, trying to correct us, dismissing us, you know, we, we know that that person, we need more of a boundary with that person than, than with other people. So really this is about changing yourself and, and requiring people around you to treat you the way that you want to be treated. And, and, and there are some pre-made kind of groups for that. You know, there's the Al-Anons and the Codependence Anonymous and hopefully good therapists and mentors that you have in your life. So there are places that you can go where you can expect with some confidence that when you state your truth, when you state your needs, the people are going to be able to respond to it. But that, of course, doesn't encompass all of life. I started off here with a quote. This is the, the, the chapter's epigraph that says, what we change inwardly will change our outer reality. So popular these days are things like ayahuasca and MDMA therapy and psilocybin therapy. There's a lot of movement toward these kind of really impactful moments. Even wilderness therapy itself is, is an impactful time or our intensives are an impactful time. But it is my experience that the process of establishing a, a life that you want to live in takes time. And it, it requires your, your unending patience and focus. I think a lot of us want to uh, perform what we call drive-by kind of boundary setting, right? Set a tough boundary. I know for myself, I've had many experiences in my life where I've set a very difficult boundary with somebody that I care about, somebody important uh, with regard to, to a very important issue. And, and what I realized is I, I have a sense of pride and, and, and serenity that comes after that moment. But what I realized, if that person's going to remain in my life, I'm going to have to maintain that boundary. Right, that people's natural tendencies, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in the broadcast. That people's natural tendencies are to send us messages that encourage us to change back to the way that we are. I wrote in the Journey of the Rogue Parent in this last last chapter, what surrounds you in life is a manifestation of what you think you deserve. It doesn't work. It will not work. It won't work to ask to be treated a certain way by others. We have to require it in order to get what we get. I, I've thought about this recently as an adult who's not financially, of course, dependent upon my parents about that moment when I wasn't held hostage by the fact that I, I needed them physically, financially, was the moment when the relationship began in many ways. It was the moment when I, I was allowed to, if I could, set boundaries with those that I love. I've said this in the last few years, prior to the pandemic, 
I've said that it took me 50 years or close to it to decide to have a holiday. Christmas, Thanksgiving, we celebrate Christmas in our family. To have a holiday where I was only with the people that I wanted to be with, not out of any kind of obligation because I should or because it was, quote unquote, the right thing to do. And this did not mean that I cut anybody out of my life, but but almost 50 years before I gave myself permission to say, here's who I want at those gatherings. And of course, it brought me so much joy. And part of it was it was out of a, a, a it was out of a position of strength, right? The fact that I had arrived at that point where I could say no to certain people and not invite certain people, and even in a couple of cases, say no to people who invited themselves, that it really became for me that 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 pure joy that comes from being able to set a boundary. I've said this before. Parents, spouses, children, people of all ages will 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 utter the phrase, he or she can't treat me that way. And what I what I reflect back often to them in very, very gentle ways over over the course of the conversation is you say they can't, but it seems like they can. It seems like that you will allow them to treat you that way and then welcome them back again. Just saying you can't treat me that way doesn't mean anything. It's a hope. It's a fantasy. There comes a point in our relationships, no matter what relationships they are, where we might have to say to have the kind of serenity that comes with mental health, that we might have to say to people, you can't come over if you do that. I can't talk to you if this is the way that it's going to be. So sometimes our mental health, I was sharing this the last time I tried to start this too. Sometimes our mental health and our progress on our mental health doesn't always end up with us having more capacity for everybody. I talk so much about developing capacity for your children. I do think I I, I sometimes mislead people in this way. The outcome of your growth could be that you don't allow somebody in your life. And I think sometimes we think, well, I just need to work harder. I need to be more patient. I need to kind of unravel something in in, in my head that's getting in the way of this relationship. But I'll say it again. The conclusion, or as we arrive at a certain level of mental health and mental health awareness, it, it, it might result in us changing the relationships in our lives. I think that's one of the most difficult things in life is that we outgrow certain people. We outgrow certain relationships. And these are people that we love. These are people that haven't profoundly abused us or hurt us. They're people that at some point in our life were, were a wonderful match and really uh, a, a, met a, a really core and important need in us. And sometimes we have to say goodbye to those people. The, the, fantasy, the, the most important thing is we won't have to say goodbye to them if they can adjust. I always talk about how with my children, I have four children, 28, 26, 19, and 13, for those of you following along. Um, That's their current ages. And I've always said that I aspire to have very little opinion about what they do or don't do. And I aspire to have uh, very little investment in in them taking one path or another in their lives. And that if it results, if they need to say to me someday in their life, all four of them, at least past 18, if they need to say to me that I can't have my father in my life because it's triggering, it costs me something in terms of my mental health, that I would 10 times out of 10 encourage them to take care of themselves, even at the expense of my relationship with them. However, what I'm learning, what I've learned so far is if you have that attitude toward them, they just keep coming back. Because why would you want to leave somebody who allowed you to be who they are, who who you are. I think that's probably my experience of of the deepest 
form of love that I've had for people in my life is when I've allowed, to, I've allowed, been allowed in the relationship to be myself. So tonight we're going to talk about on this broadcast, we're going to talk about how to create a, a, a world for ourselves, what we have to do, what's required of it for us to create a world that supports us. And I think back to times when parents have shared me with me this this idea that I remember one mother was telling me many years ago, you know, th that her family were, were constantly asking her for updates. And, and it was in the, under the, 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 the umbrella of offering support. We want to know how you're doing, how your son is doing at Evoke and so forth. And, and, she finally decided I, I have to write a, a group email once a week to give an update. And I have to tell people that I don't want to talk about it all the time. Right? Sometimes people come to us and say, you need to talk about it. It's important that you get it out. What they're really talking about is their need to be central in the drama, right? We get to decide. That goes for your children. Think about that. There will come a time, ideally for all of you, when your children are financially independent of you, where their willingness to, to share with you will, will come from their need and, and not your need or your, your perception of their need. So sometimes the people that love us, sometimes the people that we love don't know how to show up in, in ways that, that provide support for us. And unfortunately, we uh, it's incumbent on, on us then to teach them or just to remain resentful if we don't. In the back of the book, I wrote some of the things that are your rights, kind of my, my way of, of empowering you, of giving you choices. So here are some of those rights that I listed. We as parents have the right to be treated with respect from everybody, from our parents, from the therapists that we deal with. One of my soapboxes in the field of mental health is that parents struggling with boundaries or an enmeshment or enabling or anxiety or their own depression, all parents deserve respect. And when therapists look down at parents, when I hear therapists or self-help health experts, self-help experts uh, refer to parents as Helicopter parents or snowplow parents. I understand if you're calling yourself that, that's fine. But those names, those labels are intended to shame. And the fact of the matter is, we're all wounded people who were raised by wounded people, right? And you deserve the same kind of compassion that your struggling child has. And my frustration with your behavior is my problem, not yours. And I don't want to make it yours. And that's true of anybody. We have the right to make mistakes and or change our minds. I saw a quote from the great teacher, Alan Watts, who teaches about Buddhism just yesterday. And he said, we have no obligation to be the same person we were five minutes ago. You know, we know about this idea from consent, right? We talk about consent that in most cases, we're talking about a woman giving consent. But a woman can change her mind before the act, during the act, at any point that she wants to. She can decide to withdraw consent. And this is the same kind of thing with our children. See, what we're, what we're building here are the building blocks of what it means to be a human, a person. You know, we didn't learn it. We weren't taught it. We were taught something about being good. But this is about being a person. And this is the thing that if we, if, we, if we do it well, right, if we practice being ourselves well, then our children will, will learn to be themselves. And so when you hold a boundary, when you say no, when you change your mind, you're modeling for your child. You're in essence giving them permission more powerfully than any lecture you could possibly sum up. You're giving them permission to be themselves in relationships. And they are less likely than to end up in a relationship where that self has to be compromised or where they have to do certain things to, to fit in, to belong. 
sometimes those things can be self-harming. We have the right to ask questions and expect answers about all things which may affect our children. I have had some negative experiences with therapists um, with my children. And every time I have one of them, and they're not gross or, or, or extreme, right? They're not, they're not outlying. They're just judgment. Judgment toward me, my, my wife. Judgment toward our child, our situation. And what I've learned when I've been able to stand up for myself, for my family, with teachers at my children's school, with, with therapists or treatment professionals, what I've learned is how hard it is. And I think to myself, wow, I've dedicated my life to this stuff. I've dedicated my life to, to, to being and understanding parenting. And if I, for a period of time, can be compromised by somebody else's small self, by somebody else's limitations, how hard must it be for, for parents whose life's work, it is not, not psychology and parenting. I have so much compassion for all of you. And that's why it's so important, I always tell you, to tell the professionals that, that, that serve you what you think and what you feel. I remember just a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, before the pandemic, I remember having a parent-teacher meeting uh, regarding one of our children. And I, I said to her, I, I do think my daughter is sensitive to being shamed. And when she points it out that she's being shamed, I believe her. And in fact, that this particular meeting that I was pretty proud of myself for, this particular meeting that the teacher apologized and owned it. And I was very calm. I wasn't upset. And I said, thank you so much for, for owning it. I really respect that and appreciate that. And she said, well, I've apologized in the past to some parents and they use it against me. And I said, that won't happen in our family. I don't see that as a, a moment of weakness. I see that as a strength and confidence. And it's something that I'm going to not only point out that, that I'm happy that you're doing it, but I'm going to point it out to my child. We have a right to know and consult with adults who influence our children's lives, coaches, employers, teachers, youth group leaders, ministers, and counselors. I want to say this to you, and I can't, I cannot be too emphatic. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what you should do. If you don't know that by now, then you're either new to this or keep listening because it, it, it'll be clear that that's not my position. But I do want to be clear about something. I think if you parent your children well, my experience is most of the people around you will think you're doing it wrong. Let me say that again. I think if you are parenting your children well, if you are on the journey of the heroic parent, which means you're doing your work, you're trying to pay attention to emotional needs and psychological distress, and you're paying less attention to behavior. You're less inclined to punish behavior and more inclined to ask questions and be curious. You have boundaries, but it's not about behavioral change. My experience suggests to me, and I'll share it with you, most of the people around you are going to think that you're doing it wrong. Most people are going to think you're crazy or critical. Or excuse me, they're going to be critical of you. So I, I, I want to just give you that reality check. And that's why if I was your therapist, if I was coaching you in parenting, I wouldn't take assume the position of expert in terms of here's what you should do. Again, my expertise would be providing a context, a discussion, a dialogue, a relationship where you could discover who you are and be that person. So you have a right to give opinions, to consult. You know, when we were young, teachers were big. Ministers, pastors, rabbis were big. Our, our culture taught us to revere them. And we were abused by them. And I'm not talking about big T, physical or sexual abuse. I'm talking about subtle psychological abuse. And we were abused often. But we were told that our goodness as children relied on, depended on our ability 
to do what, what the authority figures, the big people in our life said. And I don't think that automatically becomes undone when we reach 18 or financial independence. When we have children of our own, we have the right to know what is happening with our own, in our own home, to set house rules and to, and to know the identity of guests who come into our home. Again, in that, that, that sentence I just read, there's a feeling in that, right? A sense in that when I read that, that, that reminds me of the feeling of feeling small, of not having a right. Our, our children can take on the persona of the people that abused us as children when we were young. How dare you? I can't believe it. They can respond to us with a, with a righteous indignation. And it will put us into that small place, that, that shameful corner we, we inhabited as, as children in those moments. And what I'm trying to do for you is to say, it's okay. You have a right to do that. We have a right to assign our children chores and other family responsibilities appropriate to their ages. We have the right to promote time together as a family, which might include meals, outing, study times, and other planned activities. We have a right to be authoritative when logical explanation or reason have not succeeded. That last one is a big one. It's almost like authoritative is, is a dirty word for most people. Because so many adults are trying to unwind the abuse of an autocratic parent, of a parent who didn't listen, of a parent who placed behavior and being good above doing okay and being well inside, mentally health speaking. And because we have that wound that we have not completely unwound, we try not to become that monster. So we don't feel empowered. We disempower ourselves in an effort to not do to our children what was done to us. We disempower ourselves. So part of the, the gift of therapy is for you to sit in the room with an empathic, capable therapist and to say, it's okay. You, you're allowed to ask that. And the shaming coming from your parents, which, which echoes uh, of the shame that you receive from adults, from adults when you were young, is a lie. I talk at length in this last chapter about selfless parenting. Selflessness is, is see, the problem with, with this word, among others, is that it means different things in different contexts. Speaking in psychology, selfless means different things than it does in Buddhism, for example, right? Or in some other philosophies. Selfless parenting, when I talk about it, is this idea of not imposing your needs not really even being present, aspiring to be the, the opposite of whatever you perceive to be selfish. That the greatest parent is the one with no needs. Think about that. Selfless parenting in the way that I'm talking about it holds in it the idea that the greatest parent is the one with no needs. Can you, can you hear how obviously damaging that is to model for a child, to not have needs. And all that is, it's no more or no less than our old, our own childhood wounding. My mother used words, my father used words when I was growing up, like selfish. That wasn't the only word. But they used those words to shame me, to make me the, the bad one in that moment. So they didn't have to feel, deal with their feelings of inadequacy of being able, of not being able to meet my needs, of, of coming up short. So instead of coping with and dealing with that ugly feeling of shame and insecurity that comes from inadequacy, an experience of inadequacy, instead of them owning their not enoughness, they made me too much. You see how that works? They gaslit me. They made me think that I was the problem. I was just Brad. 
I was just bumbling through life trying to figure it out like any other kid. And in some areas, I'm sure I, I, I took up a lot of space and a lot of energy. But, but what I've come to realize now as an adult is that in some of those ways that I took up extra space, in some of the, those areas lies my greatest gifts also. I wasn't the problem. But anyway, back to selfless parenting. This idea that it's something to aspire to. In the, in the audacity to be you, I, I say clearly that it's not about too much love. It's about not enough self. Anxious parenting. Enabling parenting. Right? Lack of boundaries with parenting. It's not about loving too much. That's a euphemism that, that we're offered to make us feel better. But the, the fact of the matter is, it's about not, not, not having enough self. And that's why the shift is from being good, being a good parent, being a good husband or a good wife or a good partner, a good friend, a good employer, a good employee. The shift is from being good to being a self, which is so much better. And ironically, being selfless reinforces a lack of empathy. I would guess somewhere around 60% of the parent applications we receive for children into our program mention something about the, the child not having um, adequate empathy. Maybe it's talked about in terms of remorse. When a parent has a self and they show up as a self, the child has to learn how to deal with an other person. But if you show up as selfless, the child doesn't have to deal with an other person. So having a self is part of what, what provokes, what teaches, what, what pulls out of the child empathy because they have to understand their impact on other people. There are other ingredients to developing empathy, but that's one of them. Another one is listening to how a child feels, to honor how a child feels. So they then respect and are sensitive to their own feelings. And when, when a human being, this is the key, when a human being feels their feelings, they recognize feelings in other people. If they learn not to feel their feelings, then they don't recognize that in another human being. But back to the selfless parenting, to be selfless is to not ask the child to have to consider another. It reinforces teenagers' center of the universe thinking. Right? This, We talk about this entitlement in part, I'm not positing these as complete solutions, but in part, that center of the universe thinking, part of it's developmental, but in part, it can be fostered by selfless parenting. It doesn't show self-love, doesn't model self-love or self-care. You know, you read everywhere these days about self-love, about self-care, healthy self-care. But we don't talk about it in the parenting relationship enough. See, if there's if there's a message for this evening that I want to get across to you, it's it's okay for you to have needs and for the limits that you have to be an expression of your humanness. I can't do this. I don't feel comfortable. That's enough. And the reason why you don't know that, the reason that I even have to tell you that or tell myself that, remind myself that, or be told that, is because we weren't shown it and taught it. Our parents tried to mold us and fit us into a shape that they could more easily tolerate. I say this all the time. The barrier to self-care and self-love for me is guilt. And if I'm not battling guilt, dealing with guilt, feeling some guilt, pushing through it and past it to some extent, if I'm not doing battle with guilt, I'm not doing good self-care. Self-care, afterwards, it can feel very, very filling and fulfilling. In fact, it, it does feel, feel that way. But I feel guilty all the time around self-care because self-care is saying no. Self-care is failing. Self-care is coming up short. Self-care challenges my whole paradigm as a human being because 
I was taught as a child, the only thing of value in me is what I could do for other people. And there are messages in the culture, let alone my family, that suggest that at times. So self-care and self-love is important. In Milan, Italy, they used to have a, a school of therapy. I don't know if it's still there, called the Milan School. And in Milan, they would have an invariant prescription, which means they gave it to virtually everybody that came in with the team. And the assignment was to leave the, the setting and to, to, to take the child out for ice cream, for whatever you do for a little treat, and to say to the child, you're fired from being the reason that we're going to therapy. We'll go to therapy whether or not you do well or poorly. We're committed to this. And you no longer have to be the, the one that forces us into therapy. We're going to work on ourselves. So you're fired from being the identified patient. And they gave that assignment to everybody. That's why they call it the invariant prescription. You see how strongly that rests on self? How strong that position is? The moment that we can see that we're the reason we're not happy and that we can fight through the illusion that it's my child's struggle that's making me unhappy or that it's my husband or my wife's problem that's making me unhappy is the moment that we're free. Because then we found the problem and the solution. And it doesn't get solved immediately. We spend the rest of our lives working on it. But at least we're working on the right problem instead of working on trying to fix everything outside of us. Selfless parenting often prevents differentiation by never allowing the child the opportunity to challenge you. If you're selfless, which is impossible, if you're selfless, then your child, it doesn't make sense for them to be upset or disappointed or angry at you, right? In fact, if they feel those things, something must be very deeply wrong with them since you're a saint. But as we're learning in this work, the goal isn't to be good. The goal isn't to be a saint. The goal is to be a whole person, which means your child gets to be mad, sad, disappointed, frustrated, angry, bothered by you, and it's okay. Selfless parenting is impossible. That's the last reason why it's a farce. It's impossible. Most people who aspire or imagine that they are selfless end up stealing, end up taking, end up giving gifts with strings attached and developing resentments and expectations around things that they do for other people. Selflessness, selflessness prevents love and connection because connection can only occur when you're connected to yourself. If you're not present, there's no relationship. And then, like I said, if you overtly, consciously aspire to be selfless, that you'll meet your needs in unhealthy, co covert ways. The tendency to steal. If you don't take care of yourself overtly, then you're likely to meet your needs in unhealthy and covert ways, such as depression or anxiety. If you're depressed, people who are going to people are going to take care of you. You end up getting medication, doctor visits, attention, time, and energy from other people. And so, in your attempt to be selfless, you have in fact engineered a way for yourself to be taken care of by other people. Your needs will be met one way or the other. They will leak. They will scream. And they will awaken like Mr. Hyde from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde if you do not learn to attend to them. If you don't know how to ask for your needs, or should I say, to the extent that you don't know how to ask for your needs, to assert them, to say no, to feel the, the, the horrible sense of, of guilt in taking care of yourself when other people are upset by it. If you don't do that, you will leak and bleed and sweat on everybody that loves you. And they will sense your neediness and they will most likely be conflicted and confused by it because they'll sense how much you need, how much you take, how much you ask. But how on the surface you, you, you wear a halo. 
So you go to Al-Anon, you go to therapy, you go to Codependence Anonymous, you go to Families Anonymous, you go to Adult Children of Alcoholics, you go to these places, you learn to take care of yourself, you learn to say no, you learn to upset people. People will call you selfish. They say that you're overdoing it. You'll be accused of all kinds of wrongs, and some of those will echo and remind you of the things that you were told as a child, but you will fight through them because you will have new programming and a new voice from people who are interested in you being yourself, interested in supporting you to be who you are. Addition by subtraction. In order for us to surround ourselves with people who can love and support us in the way that we need, we have to first require it of them. This applies to family, friends, and professionals. It is scary and will bring up feelings of guilt, but in order to create a safe context for ourselves, we will have to fight the old messages that tell us that we have to be loyal or obligated to someone, even when there is a well-established pattern of mistreatment. The, 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 the remarkable thing about this fundamental shift that, that Evoke Therapy Programs Finding You podcast invites you to do, the remarkable thing about it is you don't know who you're going to lose. You don't know who's going to rise up and evolve along with you. You don't know who you're going to find. That's the risk. That's the fantastic, terrible, terrifying risk. But on the other side of that, you have a life where the people around you support you being you. And why would it be any other way? They don't know how you should be living or what you should be doing. You'll find a different quality of people. See, Evoke Therapy programs, what we're doing, we're, we're, we're treating children in our wilderness program. And we're treating adults and families and couples in our intensive program. But more than anything that we're doing, we're trying to just encourage and empower people to, to be themselves and, and it will work out better. To be you. You'll be happier. And there'll be losses and there'll be grief. Often in storytelling and, and, and myth and in, in, in great stories, great movies, great books that we read. The death motif, right? When, when a character dies. It's a symbol or an invitation to let go of our old life. Our old ideas. Our old connections, our old habits. And there's a real genuine grief there. The reason that I spend this time with you talking on the live webinars and on the recorded podcast is because while your child is with us, if, if that's how you found us, or if you found us through some other way, the, the, this is a time for you to become who you are and to hear my voice, which by the way, I'm just doing something for you that somebody did for me. And, and when I thank that person, which I do about every six months, they say the same thing to me. She says to me, my therapist says to me, I'm just doing something for you that somebody did for me, which is to give you permission to, 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 to realize that your childhood wasn't the truth. It was just one possibility of a limitless number of possibilities and that everything you learned in your childhood isn't true. Some things are, of course, but some things aren't. And it's okay. It's necessary. This is not about skill building or a couple of tools here and there or a slight shift on something. This is a fundamental shift. I've listed on, on sources of support, Al-Anon, Alcoholics Anonymous, codependency meetings, any 12-step meetings. I list them every time at the end of every broadcast. Go to therapy for co-parenting, individual therapy or family therapy, couples therapy. I am biased. I think the foundation of all of it is individual therapy. I think the temptation to move to family or couples therapy too quickly will lead most people toward the unconscious effort at trying to change everybody else. You can do them in tandem, right? Alongside each other and in a parallel process. But I do believe that individual work is the foundation of all the other work. And that counts for you. If you happen to be one of the, the people listening or watching who has or had a child at our program, it can start there. 
But soon after that, you've got to do your individual work or family therapy, parenting therapy, all the other relationship-based therapies won't be as effective. Books, podcasts, self-help resources, reading lists, following along with your child in the program, all those things that are recommended by your therapist, those can be helpful along the way too. And we're not blaming or shaming. All we're trying to do is liberate you from the same kinds of chains that all of us are bound by. Sigmund Freud said that the result of effective therapy is freedom. And what he meant was freedom from unconscious obligations. The shoulds are, are a lie. The shame is, is a lie. But we learn those, those things in relationships and we have to unlearn them by sitting across from somebody who doesn't have any shoulds for you or judgments for you. And it's in that new kind of context where you start to realize how contrived your own context was. You learn by sitting with an empathic other that what was once bad or wrong is now nothing. It's just a wound. It's just evidence of a trauma. Evidence of something that's not dealt with. Taking vacations, literally or metaphorically, some time off. I know we ask and offer a lot of resources for the families and, and individuals that attend our program. You don't have to do all of them. Being unavailable to your children is also a very classic family therapy assignment. Some therapists, some of the great masters would purposefully assign parents to go away, to leave the children with somebody they trusted with all the necessary safety and support from an adult, but they would go away and not tell the child on purpose and make a point of not telling the children or the child on purpose where they were going just to establish the hierarchy. And part of what you're doing, I mean, it, that's why it's important that you not interrupt sessions like this if your child is texting, if you're in a in a in a, a family meeting, an Al-Anon meeting, it's really important that you're unavailable at times. It's really important. I think I, I've talked about this, haven't said it in a while, but it's really important to learn how to drop the ball and fail. In fact, I think it's a key to enlightenment, as I talk about in the audacity to be you. We have to learn to let people down. And that includes our children. We have to learn how to do it gracefully, compassionately, with plenty of self-forgiveness and self-love. That's a critical element in the parent-child relationship and in the spousal relationship and other relationships. That's a really important ingredient into everybody developing and progressing. Sometimes we ask you to write matching letters to your children. There, this, this refers to the idea that don't work harder on the relationship than, than the other one. When you're working twice as hard as your spouse or twice as hard as your child, you're off course, right? Something's out of balance. Something in you is preventing you from responding with reciprocity. So matching letters can be an assignment that kind of writes that, that process, gets it back in line with the project of becoming a person. You know, we have parent reference lists. Um, and it was actually suggested, the same person who told us to start doing webinars in 2007, which is when we started these, she also said, you need to have parent reference lists and parent mentors, not just to find out if people endorse the program, not just when somebody's inquiring about your program, but we need these lists so that we can have people that we can connect to once we're in the process. I have been a parent reference before. I'm obviously a therapist and I run the program. I own and founded the program, so I occupy a different space in, in, in much of my life. But I've also been a, a parent reference 
in a couple of instances where they didn't want to hear from a psychologist or an expert. They want to hear from a parent who had gone through it, who could empathize. Some of the maxims that I write down toward the end of the book is trust is a gift. Own it. You don't have to justify not trusting your child. I think a lot of us are held hostage by that. It's okay not to trust your child. It's not going to destroy their self-esteem. If there's a pattern of demeaning behavior, of sarcasm, of shame, if you are triggered and anxious and fearful, that's something else. But for the grand majority, if we're struggling with trust, that's okay. You just have to own it. Meaning when the child says, you don't trust me, you say, yeah, that's just where I'm at right now. You have a right to be sad, to be heard. You have a right to ask your therapist difficult questions. Your evoke therapist, your therapist at home. And to be treated with respect. Not condescended to. You have a right to forgive on your terms. And on your timetable. And accountability. True accountability does not rush for forgiveness. And reconciliation. Accountability is patient. Accountability doesn't ask for something in return. You have a right to cut off conversations with unsupportive family and friends regarding placement and treatment of your child. You really do have the right to set boundaries with your brothers and your sisters, your in-laws and your parents. You do have a right. And if they don't need to be cut off, and it's just a simple misstep, they'll respond wonderfully. But if they're really upset and shaming and dramatic when you set a boundary, all the more reason the boundary is there. They're showing up to your crises, your difficulty with their childhood wounding that they haven't resolved. You have a right to think over your answer. In our, in our program with the, with the young people, we have this phrase called no future information or no FI. That's better than saying, instead of lying about it or saying, I don't know. When you do know, but you don't want to talk about it. It's okay to say to people, your children, each other, I don't want to talk about it right now. I know that makes you anxious. I'm sorry I'm not doing it to you on purpose. You're going to have to deal with that. But here's where I am right now. I've seen parents shift from lying to their children about boundaries, aftercare, length of stay, things like that. I've seen them shift from lying to simply tell them the truth and say, yes, we do know where you're going and we do know when, but we're not going to talk about that right now. And I've seen see children feel freed up from that. And of course, the initial changes in that kind of behavior is going to be met with resistance. We call it homeostasis, right? Energy that, that tries to keep things as the status quo. You have a right to say, I don't know where I don't want to talk about it. You don't have to apologize for your boundaries, consequences, or feelings. I put on here reactions, but I might tweak that a little bit. If your reaction is aggressive, sarcastic, punitive, you can apologize for those. And you can apologize empathically for all of these. My wife just said to my daughter last night, after my daughter was complaining about a boundary, my wife said, I'm sorry. And my daughter said, no, you're not. You chose the, the, the boundary. And she said, I didn't mean I'm sorry like I won't do it or I regret doing it. I'm just sorry that it hurts. I get it. You are relevant. You are important. You are valid. Your gut is enough. Your best is good enough. You are fallible and you are good enough. Remember, we're all wounded people who were raised by wounded people, who are raising wounded, wounded people. And we don't want to wound our children, but we do. We don't want to come up short, but we do. Some of us would like not to be fallible, but we are. And so now, I said this to somebody just recently. Now the wound is the child's and it's their job to deal with it. Yes, your mother and dad and the adults in your life, they did a number on you. There's no doubt about that. 
And if you want to talk about it, I will listen as long as you like. And now it's yours to deal with. And that's true of you. And that's true of your children. A couple of principles as I conclude this chapter. Harriet Lerner described the energy of a system to return to status quo as, quote, change back, unquote. This is the dynamic that one could expect after establishing a healthy new boundary in a relationship. It's valuable to know that even our cherished loved ones will often resist change. That goes for you. You'll resist change when your children get healthier. Rare is the occasion when others celebrate our new boundaries. Whether they are children, parents, or children, partners, friends, or work associates. Still, this awareness can prepare us for the ensuing pushback we get from our children when we set new boundaries. Another story. Assume everyone else in the family is not going to change. Assume the others are going to continue to be their old idiot selves. From there, you will have the fo- you will have the focus on where it needs to be squarely on yourself. Initially, I was telling a mother and a family this at a, at a, at a, at a concluding session in our program. Initially, the mother was angry with me when I told her this, accusing me of being overly negative. I explained, I'm not being literal. I know all of you have made progress, but if you're expecting it to be easy, it's not going to work. You will end up fighting about who is doing what and how much. If you let go of the others changing, you will all contribute a lot of of positivity to the process. So I say this to your children. You might be surprised, but I say it to them when I visit. And I'm going to say the same thing to you. Um, They're not going to change. Don't plan on them changing. And the minute you let go of that, the minute you'll focus on what you need to focus on, which is you. And by the way, to be clear, I say the same thing to them. I say, don't plan on your your parents changing. You know, you know how hard it is to change when you're an adult, when everything's kind of going okay in the rest of your life, for you to think you have a reason to change. So I tell them, don't plan on your parents changing. And then I ask them, now, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to deal with that? To move toward healthy parenting, we have to learn to feel the guilt and do the right thing for ourselves anyway. We have to learn to feel guilt and do the right thing anyway, which means this. Our guilt will tell us to not set healthy boundaries, to not say no, to not tell the truth. Listen to that. The very thing that most human beings, even Brene Brown in her Famous talk says that guilt is associated with mental health. It's not. It's not associated with mental health. It's not as severe as as what we think of when we talk about shame, but it's in the same family. Your guilt will tell you to not set boundaries, to not own your limits, to not say no, to not cut off abusive quote-unquote, well-intended family members. I, that's another thing about well-intended family members. People tell me that all the time as they're doing their work. They say, well, they were well-intending. And my response is, no, they weren't. They were anxious. And that is not good or bad. It's just anxious. So we have to learn to tolerate guilt in order to do the right thing. Now I'm going to read, whenever I, when I was doing my book tour for this book, I would end with this, these couple of pages. So bear with me. I'll try to read them slowly so they are meaningful. As I conclude the book, I write this. At the beginning of this book, we started with the concept from Campbell's The, the Hero's Journey, in which the hero gets the call to adventure. In most, in, in most cases, this invitation is initially rejected. This is the part of the story when some parents stop and resist because although the call comes in the form of a suffering child, it is terrifying to try new things. We are asked to leave so many things that make us feel safe and comfortable. We are invited into sessions, treatment programs, 
and communication seminars to do family work. But because their children are in danger, many are eventually willing to answer the call and go into the darkness to face their fears. I once heard someone describe that thing we search for as we embark on the hero's journey as the thing we cannot not do. As I have had the privilege of working with parents whose children are struggling, I know of no better way to describe the courage and motivation parents demonstrate as they embark on the heroic journey. They must do this, and they must forge their own passage. It is perilous, frightening, and painful. They worry about what people will say. Some people will deride and abandon them as they forge ahead. But these parents cross the threshold and bravely plunge into the unknown. They go in because their child is in there. They go in because they believe they are there to find their child and solve their problems. Then the question, what does the hero really discover at the end of their journey? In the epic story of Gilgamesh, perhaps one of the oldest surviving works of literature, it speaks to every parent's journey. In the ancient Mesopotamian myth, Gilgamesh becomes distressed at the death of his friend Enkidu. Due to his suffering, Gilgamesh leaves his home and undertakes a long and perilous journey searching for the secret of eternal life. He endures many trials and tribulations on his quest. He swims to the bottom of the sea and retrieves the plan of immortality. When he resurfaces, he sets it down on the ground, and while he bathes, the serpent steals it, and the sacred plan of immortality is lost. Yet as he travels home, he has his story to tell. So what does the hero find? On his journey, he finds the elixir of healing wisdom, something that he can share with others. We experience deep pain and develop compassion as we face the depths of our own struggles. And what we find is our story. We sit in groups, we tell our stories, and listen to the stories of others. That is the message of this book. That is what I meant when I started with the concept that the question is not the question. It is our struggling children and our willingness to ask different questions that reveal our authentic selves. The hero brings back herself, a deeper, richer version of herself. Loving your child is something you cannot not do. You will break and bleed. Old things will die in you, and in their stead, new ones will grow. And what you will have in the end is your story. For me, even as a teacher, the elixir isn't always in the form of words. Some of what I've gleaned on my journey is difficult to put into words. That is because it's an experience rather than an explanation. You learn something by going through it that you cannot know any other way. My education and study has given me language, but being present on my painful and beautiful journey has carved out a place for more compassion towards others and myself. I am honored to sit and offer some observations from the thousands of heroes' journeys I have seen children and parents traverse. This is my story. This is my gift. This is also the gift that the remarkable, wonderful, struggling children and parents have given to me, and I, in turn, give it back to you. I end with the idea in the book that everything in this book may not work. It's my best guess. It's what I've learned on my heroic journey, inward. And all the pain and the mistakes and the missteps, the pain that I've caused myself, that I blamed others for, the pain that happened to me that, that, that was nobody's fault, the pain that came out of my mother's and my father's imperfections and how that wreaked havoc in my life until I was willing to look at it in my 40s. This is my story. I am educated with a doctoral degree in marriage and family therapy. I, I'm proud of the work and the study that I do in that field. But more than anything else, what I have to offer you, what I do offer you, comes from my own experience, my own deep dive inward. 
the take homes for this evening, I'll go through them in a timely way. You're always going to have to do battle with guilt and shame. You have rights as a person, as a parent. Work with sponsors and therapists to see if your expression of these rights is based in fear and control or not. In order to get the support you need and deserve, you will have to require it from others. You cannot expect that others will give it to you just because you asked or stated a firm demand. I just finished the book Iron John by Robert Bly. I'd never read it before. And he talked about how the son needs to steal the key from under his mother's pillow. That she won't give it to him, but that he has to steal it. In other words, we have to become who we are regardless of what our parents dream that we might become or what we can become. The end result of this will be greater serenity and peace and freedom. And this is really about developing a self, our, our personhood, the very thing we want to teach our children. And the lack of doing this work will result in passive neediness and put the child at risk of taking care of you. Or maybe even worse, giving up and losing their sense of self, their authentic or their real self. So that's all, all I have for this evening. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them on our next broadcast, which will be in a couple of days on Wednesday night. My books, that I've just finished going over both of them over the last 20 or so, 30 or so sessions. The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You are both available on Amazon. You can also get the audiobooks of either and The Audacity to Be You. I, I read that one in my own voice. So if, you, if that matters to you, I did read it. We have support groups for current and alumni parents of our wilderness program. The next one is June 10th at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And for our intensives alumni, it is June 8th. That's tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. All of these are available on our website. You can go there for the schedule. Also, you can email Malia, M-A-L-I-A, -A, at evoketherapy.com for more information or to get the link. If you want to do a deep dive into your own work, I cannot think of a better, more powerful and impactful thing you could do for you and your child than to come to an intensive. I believe in it. I believe it is a, I do it myself. I've done it many, many times myself. My family, our therapists are allowed. We, we, we pay for them to go to somebody else's. I've sent several people that, that I'm close to, to other intensives. So the next one is, the next in-person one is July 14th through 18th. I believe there's one spot left. There's also an un, online one that's available that I think also has a spot left, June 23rd through 25th. And there are, there are more each month after that. We also have coaching. I, I don't usually have this slide, but we have, we have coaches that, that, that work with parents or couples or individuals across the country virtually. So if, you, if you're interested in getting a, a weekly coach who knows this attachment-based Joseph Campbell hero's journey-based stuff that, that I'm teaching, you can go to our coaching, the coaching page on our website and contact Travis at evoketherapy.com uh, to, to have a coach to meet up with a coach. We have pursuits trips for young adults and families. These are adventure trips all over the world from three days to 30 days. You can do it at the end of a program. You can do it between programs. We ask all current parents to attend six 12-step support groups, Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, Adult Children, RefugeRecovery.org is a great place to go for an alternative support, support group experience. It's Buddhist inspired, less of an emphasis on a higher power, higher power. The National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI.org is a great place to go to get free classes and resources in your area. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app, any podcast platform. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast. Subscribe, rate us, share there, or you can go to soundcloud.com. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find us by using the handle at Evoke Therapy, or you can find us on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can search Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. Of course, we have new information on our blog each week. My next, These dates are wrong. My next one will be, uh, I think I'm doing it Wednesday. Is that right? Chi, I think it's Wednesday. So this Wednesday will be the 9th. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. June 9th, 6.30 p.m. 
uh, question and answer. If you have family and friends, extended family and friends, let me do some of the heavy lifting. Have them come and ask me tough questions and let me respond to them. That can be a way that they can support you is to get up to speed to some small degree at, at what you're learning and what you're working on. After that, I'm going to be doing a, a broadcast on psychodrama, which is the principal modality that we use at our intensive program. I know I went a little bit over tonight, but after trying to start this three times, I wasn't going to cut it short. Thank you for joining me. For and on behalf of the people that love you, thank you for being willing to do your work. And um, I count you as my people. We're all doing this together. Have a great, great evening. I'll talk to you on Wednesday night. Take care. Bye-bye.